Good morning, and welcome to St. John's Bible Seed Church in Bend, New Jersey. This is Pastor Mike, and happy Mother's Day from all of us here at St. John's to all of the mothers who are watching this morning. It is May 10th, 2020, the fourth Sunday after Easter. And on this Sunday, we are focusing on the Old Testament prophecy of the resurrection of Christ, especially as it's found in Job chapter 19. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship. He is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last he will stand upon the earth. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which he ought to have done. And we have done those things which he ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent. According to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant the most merciful Father for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, has given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beg him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson is taken from the book of Job, chapter 19, beginning at the 21st verse. Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? O oh, that my words were written, O oh, that they were inscribed in a book, O oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. second lesson is taken from St. John's Gospel, chapter 16, beginning at the 15th verse. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And when the Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth, for he who will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come, and he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you, and all that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
of the Apostles' Creed, let us confess our faith together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This morning, we're looking at our lesson from Job chapter 19, one of the most interesting chapters in the Old Testament, though this chapter was probably likely written at the same time or maybe even earlier than Genesis, some uh, Bible scholars believe. It shows a picture, a complete picture of salvation. Job in this chapter talks about God being his redeemer and vindicator. It's a special word here called goel, which appears throughout the Old Testament. A uh, great example in the book of Ruth with Boaz being Ruth's redeemer. And it was believed that by trusting God, Job would ultimately be vindicated and comforted. All of this imagery loosely in the Old Testament is shown brilliantly and clearly in the new. From verse 25 of chapter 19. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Our Old Testament lesson this morning contains this verse from Job, familiar for many reasons, among which that it is said at the beginning of funeral services in the Book of Common Prayer. So this morning I'd like to look at the two aspects which I talk about in the introduction, which are woven together in the mind of Job as he looks at his ultimate vindication and redemption. He believes that God his Redeemer and Vindicator, his Goel, will be there for him. And that by trusting that God will redeem him, by trusting in God's plan of redemption, Job will ultimately be both vindicated and comforted. Now, as far as pain in this world goes, Job is probably the epitome of going through what suffering is, and not knowing why he's suffering. There's a tendency in human nature, and we all can see this, to look for a reason when someone is suffering. In modern America, the tendency is to look for a reason in the behavior of the one who is doing the suffering. When someone has a heart attack, we say, oh, it was because that person overate and they didn't exercise, or that they smoked, or that they worked too hard. 
a woman is assaulted. And one of the first questions people tend to ask is, what was she doing in that part of town at that hour? Of course, when we experience misfortune, we're usually not anywhere near that critical. We tend to think, what did I do to deserve all this? But in reality, the idea that bad things could happen to good people is an idea that deep down we want to fight against. We don't want to accept. And one reason we find the idea of someone suffering undeservedly is such a horrible thing is because we really want to have a sense of control over our own destiny. If life is logical, then justice should be something which is guaranteed in this world. And we should be able to avoid suffering if we make all the right decisions in life. When life is chaotic, when we have no sense of control and we try to sometimes impose some kind of a logic and order and we end up blaming the victim. Several thousand years ago, a man named Job ran into this way of thinking when some of his friends came to try and console him in his grief. Now, I don't need to list all the troubles that were given to Job as his suffering is legendary and whatever you can imagine would be a worst case scenario, there is Job. So let's just say he had far more trouble and suffered far more pain than any man should ever be expected to bear. And after innocently suffering through this pain, his wife said to him, are you still holding firmly to your integrity? You should curse God and die. That was his wife's encouragement to him. Job's friends were convinced that the explanation for his suffering could be found somewhere in his own past. He had an impeccable reputation among people, but obviously he must have done something terrible that no one knew about. Perhaps Job was not aware of what he had done, and so they came there to try to find as much fault as possible. Job's friends keep urging him to examine himself more closely to discover his sin and confess his guilt. So when Job realized that his very well-meaning friends were not going to be any help at all to him, he decided to make an appeal, very interestingly, to his posterity. He reaches down the generations and he says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Parents often say something like this when we don't seem to be able to get through to our children. When you get older, you will understand that I was right. Remember what I said when you become a parent yourself. It's really the same type of idea here. Job believes he is right. And so he appeals to a future vindication. Job is confident that he is right and his friends are wrong. But nobody will listen to him. He still believes, however, that justice will ultimately prevail and that someone at some time in the future will vindicate him. And this is why he wants his testimony to be written in stone with an iron pen. But vindication in the eyes of some future generation is not enough. Job knows he needs vindication in the eyes of God. So his plea here in Job 19 is that he can discuss this with God face to face. There's so much theological depth in Job that Bible scholars have a really hard time dating it. There are so many clues throughout the book that would place Job actually either shortly after the flood or 
maybe even before the flood, or at least certainly at the time of Abraham, and this is based on the coinage, which is referred to, which would have been a coinage in use before the time of Moses. But the problem is this, at the same time, there are so many things in Job which point to such a well-developed theology and teaching about God, which is why so many scholars want to date it as late as possible, thinking, oh, that the theology in here must have developed over an extended period of time. I would certainly say that the developed idea of God being both a judge and the Redeemer defending Job before the judge is an idea which is so blatantly Trinitarian and Christian that I'm sure there would be some who would say the Job must have come after the time of Christ, even though there's so many copies of it before the time of Christ. If it wasn't for the abundance of evidence that it was before the time of Christ, they would never be able to accept it. C.S. Lewis talks about this in one of his books in terms of what he calls chronological snobbery. The idea that every generation is smarter than the next, and we know so much more than people 2,000 years ago, when that's really, when you think of it, idiotic. I think there are many ways in which we know a lot less than people even 200 years ago knew. Job is ultimately shown to be a man of faith. He comes to believe that somehow there must be someone who will intercede before him and will plead his case before God. Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job knows that argument. The best of human wisdom cannot solve his problem. Only someone who he believes already exists, someone who he calls his redeemer or vindicator, can ultimately connect human nature with God and correct what is wrong in the world. This Redeemer who is to intercede before God on behalf of Job must be a man because he must stand upon the earth. A spirit which is not bound in space and time cannot stand upon the earth. But in Job's arguing, the vindicator must himself be God. It is God himself, because he both now lives, and at the last, at the end, he will also be living and standing on the earth. Something that no human living at the time of Job could say. It's not hard to see some of the roots of Trinitarian theology found in Job. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is the mediator between God the Father and the human race. He exists from all eternity. He lives, as Job says, but in the fullness of time, he took up our human nature and he stood upon the earth in the person of Jesus as a human just as fully human as any of us. He took human suffering into his own human body. He died and he was buried. Then he rose from the dead and returned to the throne of God, the Redeemer not just of Job, certainly of Job, but also of all of God's people. Job says that, Although his flesh is going to wither away, in fact, he says, after his flesh withers away, he will see his Redeemer in his flesh. And that is so important to understand. Not he will be with his Redeemer in spirit one day. 
not that his memory or his legacy will be forever linked with his Redeemer. But Job is claiming here that his flesh will be reformed, will be resurrected, and his eyes, which are physical things, not spiritual things, his eyes will behold his vindicator and his God. Our Christian faith tells us that death is not the end. But in fact, it is only through death that we can see the true glory of the resurrection and be able to stand before God to see him in our resurrected bodies. Though we may feel that things are out of control in this world, the good news, the scriptures tell us, God not only is in control, but God brings all things together through his plan. God is not just some spectator watching, seeing, guessing as to what's going to happen. Job, of course, did not understand all these things completely. But he did recognize that the only way to God was by way of God himself. And Job was right. His Redeemer did indeed come. His Redeemer did stand upon the earth. He lives today to intercede before the Father's throne for every one of us. He pleads our case. And because of this, whatever sins we may have committed, whether known by us or unknown by us, are forgiven through Jesus. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. And this should make all of our hearts rejoice. Lord, we thank you so much for Job, for the message that he gave, for the inspiration that he gives to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit to let us know that there will be a day that after our flesh is gone, it will be reformed, resurrected, and that we will see our Redeemer and God before us. Thank you, Lord, for this message, for this inspiration. Let it be upon our hearts that we may rejoice in you. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I know that my Redeemer liveth and on the earth, and on the earth again, shall stand. again shall stand. I know eternal life he giveth, that grace and power, that grace and power are in his hand. Jesus liveth, and on the earth, and on the earth again shall stand. I know, I know, I know, I know that life he giveth, that grace and power, that grace and power are in his hand. I know. His promise never faileth. The word he speaks, the word he speaks, it cannot die. It cannot die. That cruel death my flesh assaileth. Yet I shall see. Yet I shall see him by and by. I know, I know, I know, I know that Jesus lives.
of sinful men. Grant unto your people that they may love the things which you command and desire that which you promise, that so among the varied and many changes in the world our hearts may be firmly established where we true joys are to be found. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty Father, who has given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification, Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth, through the merits of the same your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O most mighty and merciful God, to whom alone belong the issues of life and death, in this time of grievous sickness we flee unto you for relief. Deliver us, we beg you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to your ministers of healing. Bless the means of cure, and grant that, perceiving how frail is our earthly life, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, the high and mighty ruler of the universe, who does from your throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily we beg you with your favor to behold and bless your servant Donald Trump, our president, our senate and representatives in Congress assembled, Philip Murphy, the governor of our state, and all others in authority, and so replenish them with the grace of your Holy Spirit that they may always incline to your will and walk in your way, and do them plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant them in health and prosperity long to live, and finally, after this life, to attain everlasting joy and happiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the strong tower and refuge of your people, we entreat your favor upon the officers and all who have been enlisted in the service of defense of our country. Ever spare them from being ordered into a war of aggression or oppression. Use them, if need be, as your instruments in the defense of our national life and liberty. But restrain, we beg you, the greed and wrath of man, that wars may cease in all the earth. Watch over also all policemen and law enforcement officers everywhere. Protect them from harm in the performance of their duty. We beg also for firefighters, first responders, and health care workers who protect us and ours from all types of danger. Give these men and women the courage and skill to carry out their duties well and safely. When they must go into the face of danger, be by their side. Watch over their families, reminding them that those who go into danger are in your loving care. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom comes every good and perfect gift, Send down upon our bishops, especially Foley, Ray, and Chuck, and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, 
the healthful spirit of your grace, that they may truly please you, pour upon them the continual dew of your blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beg you for all sorts and conditions of men, that you would be pleased to make your ways known unto them, your saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for your holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to your fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, especially those for whom our prayers are desired. We pray for our prayer list from St. John's by the Sea Church for St. John's and other churches who are going through financial struggles at this time. We pray, Lord, you will help your word to continue to go out through the internet. And we thank you, Lord, that we are able to reach a number of people who otherwise we would not have been able to preach and minister to. We pray, Lord, for Lynn Blitz, who is still in rehab and hoping to regain the strength to return home. We pray for Dolores Mitchell, Louis Fiordamondo, Bryce Myers, Kelly and Richard Gafter, Holly, Buddy, and Haley. We pray for our friends and family who own businesses that have been so greatly affected by the virus, especially for Heather and Al, for Larry, for Mark, and for Bill. We pray for Rachel Rosenberg and her recovery from cancer, for Dominic, Sydney, Heather and Grace, Ariel and Oliver, for Noah, Jonathan, and Brian. We pray, Lord, for those from Grace Scranton, for Ron, who is now in hospice, for Jean, and we thank you so much, Lord, for her many years of ministry to your church. For Teresa's brother, Tim, and who had colon surgery recently. For Ted and Midge Stefanski. For Kelly and Eliza Arp. For those who have risked sickness to provide for others in this time, and for all those whose lives have been so greatly affected by the coronavirus. That it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Almighty God. Father of all mercies, we are unworthy servants to give humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that our hearts may be truly thankful, and that we may declare your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petition of those who ask in your Son's name, Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers and petitions to you, and grant us those things which we have asked in faith according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The, the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 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 and the love of God, and, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. And now, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. This is Cardinal St. John's by the Church. Thank you for visiting St. John's by the Church.
One, two, three, two, one. Please remember to support your local parish at this time, especially as most parishes are not able to meet together. It's easy not to remember. If you are part of the St. John's family or you wish to support our ministry, you may do so at the link below or by mailing your checks to St. John's Church. Also, while you're checking out below, please, if you are not subscribed already, please subscribe to St. John's by the Sea and click on the bell icon after you subscribe. Also, feel free to like the videos. That's always a nice thing, and it helps the videos to get promoted through YouTube. Thank you for visiting St. John's by the Sea Church. St. John's by the Sea. Church and Carter. This is Carter and Noah. Say John's by the church. Say John. Oh. Thank you for this. Thank you for visiting. Say John's by the church. Okay. This is Noah and Carter. Thank you for visiting. Thank John. Bye, see church. And this is Carter and Noah. Church.